Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator. Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. So thank you for spending the day with us. Um, today, I'm very thrilled to be collaborating once again with our friends at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington, to welcome Irena Sola and translator Mara Faye Leatham for a discussion of When I Sing and Mountains Dance in conversation with Grey Wolf Press editorial director Ethan Nozowski. Now to some housekeeping, uh, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe settings. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for our guests, uh, please click on the Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight, today's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for today is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise and we will try to resolve them quickly. We have a great lineup of events planned for you as we head into spring. So do head over to our website, communitybookstore.net and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I wanna point out in particular is tomorrow, March 16th, we're thrilled to welcome Trinidadian author Ayana Lloyd Bonwo for the US launch of her novel, When We Were Birds, in conversation with Trisha McCarter. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Irena Sola is a Catalan writer and artist, winner of the Documenta Prize for first novels, the Yibes Anagrama Prize, the European Union Prize for Literature, and the Amadeo Oyer Poetry Prize. Uh, excuse my pronunciation of Catalan. <laughs> her artwork has been exhibited in the Whitechapel Gallery. And Mara Faye Leatham is an award-winning translator and author of the novel, A Person's a Person, No Matter How Small. Her recent translations include books by Patricio Pron, uh, Max Basora, Javier Calvo, Marta Orioles, Tony Sala, and Alicia Kopf. And Ethan Nozowski is editorial director at Grey Wolf Press. He began his career at Ferris Strauss and Giroux, where he worked for 10 years, and he has also been editorial director at McSweeney's. He has edited books by Hilton Owls, Jeff Dyer, Nona Fernandez, Carmen Maria Machado, Sarah Manguso, Maggie Nelson, Jenny Offal, and Max Porter, among many others. He lives in Oakland, California. So without any further ado, I will hand it off to you three. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Community Bookstore and Third Place Books and Spencer there. Um, so I, for, as some of you may have known, um, or may, may have come here thinking that MC Pam Jang was going to be moderating this discussion. I was really looking forward to that one, but poor Pam is sick today. So um, I am the ringer um, stepping in today, but it's um, such a great pleasure. Today is the publication day of Irena Sola's When I Sing Mountains Dance and um, in Mara Leatham's fantastic translation. And um, this is a book that uh, it's just really honestly one of my favorite books I've worked on over the last several years. It's just um, a completely, um, it's a novel just full of vitality and joy while never being kind of naive about the tragedies and cruelties of the world. And, you know, there's a funny thing with um, acquiring translations. Obviously, I, I don't read Catalan myself, but um, you, you know, get reports on things, you hear about books, and um, sometimes then you acquire them without having read the whole thing. And you, um, you then get the translation delivered and you hope, oh gosh, I still hope I like, actually like this book. And, um, and this was one of those, oh my gosh, it just keeps getting better and better and better. And I just, you know, Mara just did an incredible job really with this challenge, you know, very fun. I think we'll talk about some of the pleasures of it. Um, really fun, but you know, challenging book to translate in some ways. So um, it's really um, wonderful to have Mara here with us to talk a little bit about the process of translating this really special book. And it's one that um, I think is entertaining and um, wild in a lot of ways and just really kind of thoughtful and kind of brings you to um, kind of new places and new ideas. So thanks to Irena, thanks to Mara. I'm going to read actually something that Pam wrote about the book so that I'm not just the only one kind of going on about it. The other funny thing about publishing translations is a lot, you know, usually these authors are not sort of networked into literary communities in the United States. So you don't have sort of writers that you can depend on for blurbs. So you are hoping that other writers respond to the book. And we were really lucky um, to have some writers just kind of really out of the blue saying, this is kind of amazing. So um, Pam, see Pam Zhang said um, that, when I Sing Mountains Dance is like nothing I've read before. This novel is a feral, yowling love howl to a place of such staggering majesty that it resists usual comprehension. 
by giving voice to animals, storms, outcasts, one-legged girls, birthing women, and the mountain itself. So La pushes past the limits of human experience to tell a story of instinct and earth time that is irresistible in its jagged glory. I kind of just want to steal that whole thing and not have any other descriptive property that I wrote on the book jacket. So um, um, anyway, with that, we're going to start because this is a book written in another language and probably a language that many of you have not heard spoken aloud. Um, we're going to start with Irena reading a little bit from the very beginning of the book. So thank you. I'll be mute. Thank you very much, Ethan and, and Mara and Third Place Lords and Community Bookstore. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and I'll read a little bit of the very beginning. Allah. Vam arribar amb les panxes plenes, doloroses, els ventres negres, carregats d'aigua fosca i freda i de llamps i de tro. Veníem del mar i d'altres muntanyes i ves a saber de quins llocs més i ves a saber què havíem vist. Rescàvem la pedra dalt dels cims com sal perquè no hi brotessin ni les males herbes. Triàvem el color de les carenes i dels camps i la brillantor dels rius i dels ulls que miren en l'aire. Quan ens van llembregar, les bèsties salvatgines es van arraulir caus en dintre i van arronsar el coll i van aixecar el musell per sentir l'olor de terra molla que s'apropava. Els vam tapar a tots com una manta. Els roures i els boixos i els redolls i els avets. I tots plegats van fer silenci perquè érem un sostre sever que decidia sobre la tranquil·litat i la felicitat de tenir l'esperit sec. I now Mara will read that in English. Sorry, go ahead. Lightning. This is the first chapter. We arrive with full bellies, painfully full, black bellies, burdened with cold, dark water, lightning bolts, and thunderclaps. We came from the sea and from other mountains and from unthinkable places, and we'd seen unthinkable things. We scratched at the rock atop the peaks as if we bore salt to ensure not even weeds would sprout there. We chose the color of the hills and the fields and the gleams in rivers and the glints in upward glancing eyes. When the wild beasts caught sight of us, they cowered deep in their caves and crimped their necks, lifting their snouts to catch the scent of damp earth approaching. We covered them all like a blanket, the oak and the boxwood and the birch and the fir. Shh. And they all went silent because we were a stern roof and it was up to us to decide who would have the tranquility and joy of a dry soul. After our arrival, all was stillness and pressure and we forced the thin air down to bedrock, then let loose the first thunderclap. Bang, a reprieve. And the coiled snails shuddered in their secluded homes, godless and without a prayer knowing that if they didn't drown, they would emerge redeemed to breathe the dampness in. And then we poured water out in colossal drops like coins onto the earth and the grass and the stones, and the mighty thunderclap resounded inside the chest cavity of every beast. And that was when the man said, damn and blast. He said it aloud, because when a man is alone, there's no need to think in silence. Damn and blast, you had to get yourself stuck in a storm. And we laughed, ha, 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 as we dampened his head and our water slunk into his collar and slid down his shoulder and the small of his back. Our droplets were cold and made him cross. Thank you, Mara. So this is a book that starts with a murder of sorts, um, but the, um, so it's kind of a thriller. But it's actually not exactly a thriller because you sort of know what happens at the beginning, but the, um, um, yes, it, it starts in a zoomed out perspective with this, you know, the most sort of cosmic sense of narrating kind of from nature, you know, all the way up down to the kind of effects that, you know, nature has on, on um, this very particular human, this poet, um, yet this young man who's wandering across the mountains, 
um, collecting mushrooms. And um, I'm curious, Mara, where, like, when you first read these opening pages, and you had reported on the book for us, but then also, be, you know, you're translating on it, uh, translating it. What, when you heard Irena reading here, but then when you sort of read these pages for the first time, what were the things that jumped out at you as a translator as things that were interesting or things that you were like, I have to capture that aspect of what's in those lines, or it will be tricky to capture X, this aspect of what's in those lines. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, usually uh, I sort of really kind of attack the words and then try to make larger sense of them, the, the forest and the trees dance. Um, but th then this chapter wasn't the one that scared me <laughs> as much as the second one, um, which um, I, I, and, and the, and the chapter called poetry, those were the ones that, that scared me uh, in the beginning. Although um, in the end it, 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 was, it was okay. But um, I, one of the things that I like about this voice is, is the arrogance of it. Um, and, the, and a lot of the larger natural narrators um, of this book have that arrogance. So I thought that was something particularly important to get across. Yeah, and I think that's sort of what, you know, we're sort of certainly looking for, you know, when you sort of are trying to find the right translator for a project, it's just capturing that voice, you know, and I think this is a book so full of vitality that you just wanted energy was sort of the, and of course with like them, you really want the energy. So now this is a book, um, uh, as people are getting a sense of it, for those who haven't read it or haven't read about it very much yet, it's um, multi-voiced. Every chapter is essentially a different narrator, although some characters kind of, you know, keep appearing through, um, uh, through distinct perspectives. And um, I, I am always surprised, Irena, when, when I read that, that actually this was the first chapter you wrote, even though it's the beginning of the book, that you in a way didn't so much start with the human characters as with the, as with the um, kind of uh, natural or supernatural in a way um, um, figures in the book. And some months ago you, you described, I, you sent me something where you described your process for this novel and really a lot of the writing, the fiction writing you do that begins with archival material and research. And so I was wondering if you could both talk about that process of research and then how you, how this chapter arrived in you like a lightning bolt perhaps. Yeah, sure. Um, when I when I started thinking about this about this novel, um, I had two key ideas in 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 my mind. Um, and when I start thinking on on a novel, I like I, I never decide which novel I'm gonna write, or I never decide how, how it's gonna start or how it's gonna end or what's gonna happen. Um, I what I actually do is try to understand what I am interested in, what questions do I want to ask, what things do I want to learn. Um, so for me, the, the process of writing a novel is very, um, is very exciting and very important. I would say it's as important as the result. But there were two key ideas at the very beginning of this novel. Um, one of those was that I wanted to look at the world from as many perspectives and as many points of view as possible. And I, and I decided I wanted to choose a specific stretch a specific patch of the world and I chose the Pyrenees mountains and I wanted to look at it from from the perspective of everyone who who lives there or who might pass by those mountains and I when I say everyone I mean the humans who live there but also um, the humans who lived there in the past maybe or those who died there but also um, non-human beings um, to look at it from the perspective of, of animals who might live there or of a storm approaching those mountains like the chapter that we have just read or even the perspective of the mythological creatures that are supposed to live in those mountains or the perspective of the earth itself. And then, um, and then the, I had another idea in my mind which was um, I was interested in unearthing, in digging up, in analyzing all the stories, um, all the anecdotes, all the occurrences, all the events that had happened in, a, in that place. Like if I was just like looking at those stories, human and not human, individual and, 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 and like 
community stories. And, and I was trying to, to make sense of, of those. Um, but then, as you said, um, the first thing I wrote um, while, while starting to play around with this, with this novel was this first chapter. After, after writing this, I wrote nothing else in order. I, I always say that somehow I wrote the whole novel at the same time because the novel is like very, like every chapter is extremely connected to the rest. So I wrote nothing else in order, but I wrote this chapter first. And in writing this, in writing this chapter, I would say that I, I discovered two things. Um, on the first hand, I realized that it could be done. Like I could, um, like invade, embody the perspective of a storm approaching a mountain, um, and it it somehow worked. And then on the other hand, I had lots of fun. Like this chapter was extremely fun to write, and I would say that most of the of the of the chapters were big fun to write um and so after writing this um after writing this chapter i somehow gave myself the the freedom and the permission to 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 be very playful and to and to try out all the crazy ideas that could cross my mind um in order to write um this novel and this is how um at some point, I had the idea of writing one of these chapters from the perspective of a group of mushrooms, and I tried, and it worked, and it's it's in the book, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Did you? I mean, you know, the mushroom. I feel like the mushroom chapter, in a way, is like the hit single of this book or something. But it's it's just so interesting too because there's a a danger in trying to narrate from the perspective of a deer or a dog or, a, or an earthquake or a tectonic plate or what have you, which is, you know, anthropomorphizing in a way, you know, kind of just making them humans, but in the form, but where, was there, how, how did you sort of channel these or did you, was it, did you research mushrooms and then figure out, well, what would it mean to narrate or did you just imagine it and go into it? Oh, no, no, no. I had to do lots of research on most of the things that appear on the book because I don't know or I didn't know enough about mushrooms, but I didn't know enough about clouds formation and, and, and storms or, or enough about court proceedings um, for witchcraft in like, like three and 300 and 400 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there was a lot of research involved in, in the book. I always say that somehow um, when I write, what I, when I, what I do is I, I build this, swimming pool or I fill this swimming pool with um, knowledge, with learnings. Um, I try to read a lot. I try to visit the places that I'm talking about. I try to get to know people that are experts in things that um, I am interested in. And I start filling this like swimming pool. And then when it's half full, I jump in and I start swimming. Um, swimming is writing. But I, while I write, I have to continue researching because writing always takes you to places that you could not imagine before started write, before you started writing. So um, I never do like all my research and after that I start writing. I always start researching. The more you research, the more things you get interested in because um, that's how it goes. But then I always start playing around with what I already know, with what I've learned. And then I continue asking questions and then I continue researching. And for this novel, I, yeah, I researched a lot of, a lot, about lots of things. I feel like there's a danger with a half full swimming pool and jumping in that you might really hurt yourself, but, um, <laughs> which I think most many writers would, would do, but you've um, really managed um, to make it look so effortless. And, and I feel like the pleasure in the writing really does, does come across here, thanks to, to Mara, of course, in many ways. So the, um, I'm curious too, though, just about the characters, because on the one, so you've got this crazy collage of a book, you know, with many different voices. Um, it's fragmented in some ways, but how did you locate and pursue the narrative energy to pull somebody all the way through it? And I, you know, in parts through this family. So I'm wondering when you wrote, wrote that first chapter, this is where I'm going to start learning that I'm pronouncing all of the characters' names wrong, because um, I've never said them out loud, I think. But, um, <laughs> but um, did, like, was Domen Domenic um, there for you in that, in that first chapter, did you know his family? Like, what? How did the, if you could describe how he, how the where the characters came from, and how you kind of maintained that through line, I guess, or how was that a 
sort of struggle in the drafting process or did you sort of know where you wanted to go? Yeah, sure. I, um, I set myself to do all this we've talked about, about the voices and the perspectives by focusing on telling the story of a specific family and a specific family that lives upon these mountains and that suffers to um, tragic deaths and violent deaths upon those, those hills. Um, and somehow when I, was, um, when I was writing the novel and I decided that um, I would be using this, like every chapter is written from a different perspective and point of view. And I also decided that each chapter um, or each, char each character would only speak once, would only tell us their views on the world one time. Um, so when I started building all this, I realized that it was very important that, as you said, um, I could maintain the attention of the reader and I could um, bind all these chapters together. So somehow I imagined that all the voices, all the different voices that were building like a mountain of voices. And then there was the story of this family, the story of Dumenak, which you pronounce very well, and and CEO and Ilari and Mia. And the story of these people, I imagined as a river, a river that was crossing this mountain of voices. So um, the river is there in each chapter, but it, it has a different position, a different importance. So in some, in some chapters, the river, which is the story of this family, might be in the middle of the chapter, like everything you, you can see during that chapter is this huge, big river. But then there are other chapters in which you can see no river, but you can only like hear like, like the sound of the river, or it's a subterranean river in another chapter and you don't see it and then suddenly it appears and then suddenly it disappears again. Um, or in another chapter, the river might be very far away and you can only see like a little bit of shiny water in the, in the distance. So yes, when I started playing around with the voices and when I started this first chapter, I knew there would be like that family was there. And I knew from the very, very beginning that there would be two accidents um, in like in this family, two very violent accidents. And for me, um, it was very important too, the idea of killing Dumenak at the very beginning of the novel, because somehow Dumenak could very easily be the, the hero um, of, this, of this novel. He, in, in, in most stories or in traditional stories, um, he's a young man, he's a very handsome man, he's um, also a creative man in the sense that he is a poet. So he could have been the hero. But in, in this novel, what I tried to do is um, think a lot about the voice, about authorship, about perspective, about whose stories have been told and whose stories have not been told or have been neglected, whose voices have we heard, um, whose perspectives, points of view have survived and whose haven't. Therefore, it was interesting for me to play a little bit with the reader and present this character at the very beginning that um, you could think, okay, okay, let's follow him. He is the main character. And then at like the second page, I would just like kill him. And because he is not the, the main character because there are many other voices, many other characters that are important in this, in this novel. And also because um, it is very, it is key in this novel, the, the idea of, um, of perspectives in the sense that um, Dumenak's death it is a tragedy for Domenic and maybe for his wife, Sio, and maybe for his children. Um, but if you don't look at Domenic's death from a human perspective or from his perspective, um, suddenly it has a total different meaning in the sense that um, Domenic is speaking of mushrooms, uh, like a lightning bolt hits him, he dies, and that's terrible. But one second after this has happened, the grass continues growing in that mountain, roar deer continue eating, and the clouds continue their way, and everything continues. And, and this kind of cruel optimism of life um, is something that I was very, very interested in. So starting with this was, um, was important too.
there's a bit of a, a fall, there's a there's a bit of a fall of Icarus sort of quality to it, you know, with the Icarus falling in the corner of the painting and the life going on around it. Um, I want to switch now to the um, that's a good transition for the translation of this book. Um, and I want to talk a little get kind of dig into the process that you engaged in with Mara. Um, and I would just want to show people for it the, the multi voice quality. I don't know if you can really see, but well, no, the, my blur is really going to kill this. But the table of contents shows. 20 maybe more voices um, that, uh, that Irena has described. So, you know, I think, you know, I was talking about you, you're looking for energy when you're looking for a translator and just, you know, somebody who can inhabit a voice, but this novel has a couple of dozen voices. So Mara, how did this translation not drive you insane? Why was this an interesting project? You had to create so many different voices and how, how did you approach that challenge? Well, I've spent many years um, translating samples where I do the first three chapters of <laughs> probably 20 books a year. So that <laughs> is, uh, I enjoy, you know, getting into something quickly and the none of the chapters are very long. So they sort of have a standalone quality. And some of them are, you know, like the mushrooms chapter, that's a very rare voice to be able to inhabit is that collective voice. Um, that's, that's fun. I mean, you, you don't have the sort of learning curve that, you know, when you're getting towards the end of a translation, it's everything's flowing more easily, much like the writing process itself. Um, but Besides that, um, no, it wasn't wasn't crazy making at all. And I and I was able to uh, rely on Irena to um, to to give me support when I when I felt insecure because there were some voices that were more more of a reach for me um, than others, um, for sure. So you're not. I, I remember reading that. that great translator Gregory Rabassa, you know, who translated 100 Years of Solitude, like his method of translation was he would just start on the first page and just type until he got to the end and then he'd revise or something. But I take it that that is not, not your method. Will you sort of dig in on a sentence and go back or how did, what's your kind of? Well, I, I no, I usually do go um, through a first draft. Of course, I don't use a typewriter. So, um, there's a lot more wiggle room um, and and I you know leave asterisks wherever I want to come back to something that I'm not altogether happy with and then of course when you read it through other things come to light um, you know it says before or for or you know just things that you're, you're not thinking of when you're just typing the words but yeah I, 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 I pretty much go through it I I'm always struck by how different it is to read a book than to translate it. So, you know, I, when I read this book, I wanted to translate it, but it, that didn't really prepare me for the experience. I'm always, I'm always struck by that. Um, what were, what were some of the, as you kind of, what, you know, you'd obviously read the book and we talked about it um, before Grey Wolf acquired it, but um, but then it became the reality that you were going to translate the book. So then as you approached it and read it again, what were some of the challenges that jumped out at you? And, you know, I can think of some just in our own process, but I'd be curious what you would recall from that process. Um, well, as I say, one of the things that, um, that gave me the most hesitation was, was the voice of the witches, because it's a, it's a period voice. I mean, that when Irena was talking about her process, I, I was thinking of the narratives as sort of like geological strata that kind of sit on top of each other and there's encrusted fossils. And so um, the, the voices that are more historical and more mythological it took, me, took me more out of my comfort zone, I would say, for sure. I remember the slang being really tricky to you know, that so many there are many different characters with many different sorts of accents and I remember trying to find like well do we try to approximate that but then the accents sound weirdly American you know like if it's a very rural sort of person with you know um, you know who's you know maybe comes from more of an oral culture and doesn't sort of speak you know you know kind of uh, formal uh, Catalan or Spanish in some cases. Um, you know, how do we represent that in English? And that was, I found that to be really tricky to resolve because 
you know, in other translations, that's a problem that comes up a lot in translation, but in others, you kind of make a decision. And here we had to make so many decisions for each sort of different, different voice. And that was really tricky. And then the other, I don't even remember the process, but there's a, a shift in, um, there's a shift in this book where, which would, you know, for somebody in Catalonia and Spain would be really dramatic, which was a point at which the, 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 the book shifts from Catalan to Spanish. And if we, if you, do you remember how we discussed that? Or do you want to talk about that? Or how, how were you thinking about it initially in terms of how do you find a solution to this kind of thing that's so culturally huge, you know, in the original, but is going to like, you, like, do you need a footnote in the translation? You know, it's like when it's that subtle, how do we discuss these things? Yeah, we always want to avoid footnotes, <laughs> um, but it, it's something that um, people who translate from Catalan have to deal with increasingly as Catalan literature reflects more the linguistic realities of Catalonia, um, where, you know, always a, someone who is a, you know, an officer of the law will, will probably be speaking in Spanish, and even though the person might be answering them in Catalan, so they're there's this duality, this bilingualism that's that's very, um, very profound, and and they just coexist in a way that is very hard to approximate in English. Um, there's times when it's almost similar to Spanglish, where there's you know just a word thrown in, but um, again that sort of is transporting it in a in a way that is complicated it it there there in this book there's one chapter um where it's a a ghost who is from spain not from from another part of spain and not from catalonia who just ended up there and, and died there um and i think originally i thought maybe put the whole thing in italics which is one solution that we sometimes use and I think I got from Peter Bush. Um, and then there were some times when she used Catalan. So I maintained that in the end and put that in italics and sort of, I think pretty pretty smoothly uh, made it work. There, there were very subtle clues like, you know, someone's name when, when it's in Spanish or in Catalan. So in that chapter, I had to be very careful with the copy editing that it didn't all get smoothed out. Um, again, it's very subtle. So that's um, something that's very hard to, to maintain in, in translation. And Irina, you, you know, in this case, you know, it's not always the case that we have um, the, the author of the original book who's fluent in English. Um, in this case, uh, you are. So were you, can you talk a little bit about how you worked with Mara, what kinds of questions you had, or what, what, what things, how you were able to convey what was important, and then also in a way, was it a burden to know so much? You know, this book is being translated into 20 languages. So did it feel like an extra burden or, you know, have you been involved in the other translations or has the process of doing this into English in some ways being so close to it helped you raise questions, that, things that you might want to point out in other languages and other translations? Um, for me, the, the, the translation process with Mara was extremely beautiful and extremely exciting. And I think Mara has done an amazing job with this translation. I had um, had lots of fun rereading it in in English and 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 seeing how she managed to like to make each chapter be reborn in like in this other language, but but um, be still like very playful and, and very unique um, inside this whole this whole narrative. So um, first of all, that's that's something huge, and then it was not a burden at all because um, I I can only speak and read Catalan, Spanish, and English. So it was very exciting for me to be able to be part of the process and to be able to um, talk with Mara and to um, like answer her questions and 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 yeah and, and reflect deeper on each character and why this character said this or does that etc i could do that only only um, with the with the spanish translation um, which i tried to be part of the of the process too and then with the other languages i can only answer the questions that translators have and 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 help them as much as possible and it's funny how some translators have lots of questions and some others almost have none so i guess it also absolutely depends on the 
on the on the translator. But I, yeah, I remember, for example, with with Mara, um, we were working quite a lot on the poetry chapter. And it's a chapter that um, it, like there is this character who is also a poet, and lots of lots of the um, of the chapter is written through his poetry. And I remember Mara being a little bit worried about about how to translate that. And I, I, it was quite funny because at some point I remember telling her, well, Ilari, like he loves his poetry. He's absolutely engaged with the idea of poetry. He thinks poetry is the greatest thing in the world, but maybe he's not the best poet of, of the world. Maybe he's just like, I mean, I never this discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I love Ilari. And I, I like, I, I always say like writing this chapter was extremely um, funny because those are not my poems, those are Ilari's poems. And I could invade his voice and, and look at the world through his um, eyes and through his poems. But I wouldn't say he's the best poet in the world. So that was, I remember me and Mara laughing quite a lot about like this, <laughs> this whole Ilari poem. <laughs> I don't have to take these good poems. <laughs> Um, I just want to say that um, for people who are um, watching, we're, we're going to leave a, a decent amount of time for questions at the end. We're get, um, so um, you can throw them into the Q&A chat. Please don't put them in the discussion chat. If you could throw them in the Q&A chat, they're a little easier to keep track of. So um, I'm going to probably have another question um, towards the end. But, um, um, but first, we want to read another passage. And it's funny because I really do think for all the multivocal quality, I think especially in the in the sort of back half as as Mia's character really comes to the fore, this becomes a, a really profoundly moving book for all that these stories are set against these kinds of grand um, uh, forces. Um, but it is also playful sort of throughout. And in the in the back half, there's um, we were talking just before um, as as we were all logging on. Um, Irena and Mara and I, and I was telling them an anecdote that I don't think I'd mentioned to Irena or Mara before, but I was editing this translation sort of in the midst of the, I think of the, of the, of the lockdowns and I had no childcare and my eight year old was um, sitting on my, like neck, you know, squished next to me on a chair while I was editing this translation we got and she was, and I was telling her, she was really enjoying it. I said, oh, well, you know, there are mushrooms that narrate this book and we were looking at that. And I was like, and here are the clouds and here, you know, and she was really loving that she, you know, that this, this book, this adult book would narrate all of these voices. So then she was watching me and she was like, oh, you know, and I was like, oh, and this chapter is narrated by a dog. And um, so I was letting her read along and she was just cracking up and loving it. But then it gets really filthy because you realize what the dog is watching as, um, as, as she, she, I think, you know, is, it, is yeah. she, I can't remember. Yeah, as, as she um, kind of goes into the bedroom of her owner's um, house. So I thought we, we thought we'd maybe read one more passage in the Catalan um, and Mara will then read the translation after that. La quarta cosa que m'agrada més és tastar coses. Haig de vigilar, ser silenciosa i llesta quan provo coses, perquè ella sempre diu, no, tu pinso, tu pinso, lluna. I a vegades alguns ossos i algunes sobres delicioses, però meló no, meló no. I el meló és la delectació més refrescant d'aquest univers. I pa no, pa no, i vi no, i cervesa no, i pedres no, i caca no, i que jo vull provar-ho tot. Però perquè tot té un gust i tots els gustos són diferents. I fins i tot les coses que són la mateixa cosa tenen sempre gustos diferents. I jo ho vull tot, encara que ella digui no, tu no en pots veure, però jo puc veure de tot el cafè i el licor i el suc i el vi, tot. Avui ha vingut l'home del bastó i veuen cafè i whisky. No, per tu no, lluna, no, diuen i riuen. I riuen més. I com més gots se'n passen, més a prop s'asseuen i ajunten les boques. Ella i l'home, com qui beu aigua d'una font, com qui té molta, molta i molta set i molta gana i llavors s'aixequen i ja no volen més cafè. Quan no miren, tasto el cafè i el licor silenciosa, sense trencar res, sense fer soroll. I jo, jo ja no sé què vull. Si veure cafè, ara que marxen, o si rosegar el bastó, ara que l'ha deixat sol, o si anar amb ells, ara que es fiquen a l'habitació, si tastar el cafè, si mossegar el bastó, o si ens fiquem a l'habitació. I llavors es destapen la pell, la que sempre duen tapada amb robes, com si fes fred de ser pelat i aleshores surten les olors. Uh, 
uh, when Ethan asked what I wanted to read, I I was I recently was working on the subtitles um, for a theatrical version of this novel, um, a video of the theatrical version of this novel, which was very interesting because um, I guess because my mind doesn't really work that way to sort of imagine things staged. So seeing it staged um, and you know, putting my words in there um, was a very interesting experience. And one of the um, more fun parts was, was the voice of Yuna, who is um, Mia's dog. So here we go. The fourth thing I like is tasting things. I have to be stealthy and silent and clever when I try things, because she always says, no, you're dry food, you're dry food, Yuna. And sometimes some bones and some delicious wet food, but not melon, melon, no. And melon is the most refreshing delight in this universe. And bread, no, bread, no. And wine, no. And beer, no. And rocks, no. And poop, no. And I want to try it all because everything has a taste and all the tastes are different. And even the things that are the same things always have different tastes. And I want it all, even though she says, no, not that, not that. I want it. They drink coffee and they tell dogs, no, you can't drink that. But I can drink anything, coffee and liquor, juice and wine, anything and everything. Today, the man with the cane came and they're drinking coffee and whiskey no not for you you not know they say and they laugh and they keep laughing and the more cups they swallow the closer they sit to each other and they put their mouths together she and the man like someone drinking water from a spring like somebody really really thirsty and really hungry and then they get up and they don't want any more coffee when they aren't looking I taste the coffee and the liquor silently not breaking anything not making any noise mm -hmm. and I don't know anymore what I want to drink the coffee now that they're leaving or to gnaw on the cane now that he's left it alone or to go with them now that they're headed to the bedroom should I taste the coffee chew on the cane or we go to the bedroom and then they uncover their skin which they always have covered up with clothes as if being all hairless like that is awfully cold. And then come the smells. The smells they give off are arousing and pleasing and I like them and I wanna taste them. They're damp, moist smells because all the dampness, uh, in the dampness are all the smells. They take off their clothes quickly. Under their arms, the smells are bitter and scratchy. In their sexes, the smells are strong and pointy and stick in your nose and get on your tongue. And you wanna smell them more and more because the smell of sex is sets off your thirst and your curiosity and your desire to copulate, but smell fun and twist it up, much more interesting than the smell of feet, which is boring and actually smells just the same as shoes, which are more fun to chew for their rat shape than because they taste or smell good. All right, you're such a great reader. Thank you. I've been listening to that for a while. Um, <laughs> So um, I can ask, you know, maybe one more question, I, I think. And, um, and then, I, you know, if, if Mara and Irena, you have other questions for each other, please fill in. But, you know, I really, I think one of the ways I've, I've thought about this book from the beginning, you know, when I first read it, but, you know, even just as, you know, what I was learning about it early on is the way that it sets human and um, human history, like, I guess, uh, personal events and human history against the drop, backdrop of these huge and even geologic forces. And there's a sort of a quality, you know, maybe this is true of people who live near mountains and oceans, especially, but it, where, where very big things can make you feel very small, I guess. And um, there's a kind of a sublime quality to it, but there can be, um, there's a way in which it can make, you know, kind of human events look inconsequential or small or meaningless. And I've been, I was really, I'm really struck in this book, how you make these human things seem very small but not meaningless because there's some very consequential things that you talk about in this book. And I, I think especially, you know, um, you probably have it, we didn't sort of like foreground it in, in sort of our descriptive copy as much, but the Spanish Civil War is a big story in this book. And I think of, um, you know, so many books I've read from Spain in particular that are about the Spanish Civil War in the same way that we read so many books about the American Civil War here that was sort of endless. And, um, but I was really struck at how different your approach to it was here. And I was wondering like what, how, both how you thread this needle of not making these very serious human events look meaningless, which is kind of nihilistic, but with this desire to kind of place them in perspective. And I was wondering if that was sort of a conscious thing that you've written about or written towards, or whether that was something you were trying to, to balance as you, as you edited. Um, yeah, absolutely. That, that, that was something that I was um, thinking a lot about like, um, in being in in deciding to play around with the voices and the perspectives, um, I realized that I what I actually wanted to do, apart of 
having fun, because as I've said quite a lot, it's a playful book to write and also to read. But these perspectives, these voices, allowed me the possibility of, of thinking on, of, um, you know, thinking in like very deep thoughts, of um, placing myself in, in perspectives and, and, and point of view, sometimes um, contrary, um, that made um, like a deeper understanding of certain things. Like, um, for example, in, in deciding, in talking or in writing a chapter from the perspective of the mountain itself, um, this will allow me to think about time in the sense that we humans have 80 years to say everything we have to say, to do everything we have to do, to feel everything we can feel. Um, and that is a lot, that's, that's everything we will have. Um, so this is important, these 80 years are the most important years you will have. But at the same time, from the perspective of um, the mountain, 80 years is, is nothing, absolutely nothing, it's like a second. Um, but this doesn't mean that your 80 years as a human being are not important. So um, this allowed me to, to be very playful. Or for example, the fact that some of these characters are talking from the other side. Some of these characters, as we already said, are um, ghosts or spirits or people who have died. But in, in being ghosts, in talking about um, their lives and their deaths from this other side. This allowed me to, to, to think about life and death in a way that otherwise I would have not been able to, to do. And some of, these, some of these characters even laugh at their own deaths or laugh at their murderers. And somehow this is, um, when, when you read it and when you write it, um, this, is, this is something that that strikes you, that, that, that can be even painful. And there is this chapter written from the perspective of this little girl um, who was um, escaping the Spanish Civil War um, with, his, with her family. And this, this chapter, this character, this girl is based on a real girl. There is a, a quite famous um, picture of a family crossing the Pyrenees in order to, to escape to France. And in this family, there is a, uh, in this picture, there is a, a dad, and you can see in his face, he, um, he's very tired and very, and extremely sad and destroyed. And he's a, like, he has his children with him and two of his children, um, like because of the bombings and because of the war, they lost their legs or, or their feet. So it's a very, it's a very hard um, image. Um, and I base these characters in this in this in this chapter in this little girl, um, but in in doing so, I I was able to invade the perspective of a little child who died in my novel, but who is a ghost who still lives in these mountains. So she tells us about the civil war, about her death, about her family, about his dad's her dad's feelings in a way that is very innocent because she's a, a girl who is eight years old, um, in a way that is quite full of light because um, as a ghost, she is a very happy ghost um, who has chosen to stay in these mountains and to swim in this river and who has friends among these mountains and who um, plays around and, and she's a happy ghost. But the mixture of these like very terrible events, the Spanish Civil War and everything that happened to her and her family with her um, innocent and, 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 and lightful voice, um, it allows me to, to say um, deeper things about the Civil War that I would have been able to if I had tried to to talk about the civil war from another perspective, or even from the perspective from of, of an adult, or yeah, so that's what I tried to do. <laughs> yeah, certainly that it's so fresh for me because I feel like I had read I have read you know a lot of other kind of approaches to it that are maybe a little bit more more head on, and also just listening to you makes me think about a lot of the suffering that we're reading about in the newspapers today, um, the reality of that. Um, I'm gonna, there is a question in the chat here that I'm going to answer, and then also, uh, you know, there's probably room for, if there's a question that 
Yorena or Mara, you have for each other, you've not somehow been able to ask across your process. <laughs> I have a moment for that. Um, so there's a question here that says, Irena, uh, congratulations on your award-winning novel, which I look forward to reading soon. My question, how did you coordinate and manage your multiple narrative voices and maintaining a perspective for the reader? So maybe, um, you know, you touched on some of that before, but maybe like, was there a process? Did you keep, was there, did you have like a spreadsheet? Did you look, or were you just sort of feeling your way through it? And then how did you kind of, yeah, how did you, did you rearrange them at certain points or how did, how did you do that maybe to go, go from there? Um, this was a um, strange novel for me to write because it's a novel that it somehow, I always say that when I started thinking on this novel, I was finishing my previous novel. I, I had it, the previous one. I, I could see it, it was, it was done, but I, and I was just like kind of editing it um, and, and, and polishing it and just making little changes. And I, I like this process of editing, of polishing, but I have to say that I, I, I love the, like the creativity process, the, the sparkles process, the ideas moment. Um, so while I was working on that previous novel, I started realizing that um, this next novel, when I sing Mountains Dance, wanted to, um, to be, wanted to exist, because um, it kept like coming into my mind, like its characters, its voices kept like coming in without knocking at the door. So I started like taking some notes and reading and researching a little bit. And I thought I would do that um, and, and that would be it. I would be able to finish the other one and, and, and it would just be like, okay, let's make some notes to, not to forget and these ideas. But what happened was actually that um, this novel invaded um, my everyday life. And I have this, I have this, um, I used to have this feeling that the novel was kind of becoming. It was running in front of me, and I had to I had to run um, behind in order to to reach it because it was um, yeah it was a novel that was not difficult at all to write, um, and that it was big fun. So I hope most of my novels will be like this one, and I know it will, will not be the case because every novel is very different and it has a very different process. So it was a very organic novel to write it was very fluid and I did make lots of notes but I um it somehow like I didn't have to 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 throw away um any writing for example and I did move some of the chapters but not many and I had the first version and then I realized I wanted a little like some more chapters like for example at the very beginning um I hadn't thought about uh, a chapter written from the perspective of mushrooms. And at some point in the writing, I, I wanted to do that, I had that idea. Or at the very beginning, I had not thought that one chapter would be written from the perspective of the mountain. But at some point I realized one second. So everyone talks in this mountain, everyone gives their opinion, except for the mountain. And I realized, okay, this, I, this is not possible. I, I need to find a way to invade the mountain's perspective. So, so yeah, there was notes and there was moving, but it was very organic, I would say. I was, Go ahead, Mara. Oh, I was thinking about the relationship between your first novel and this novel, which, um, you know, this novel has been such a phenomenon and I'm sure you are, you've been talking about it for years now, but, um, when I was thinking about the first one in which the subject matter is narration in a mm. way. Um, and then this is it's sort of from the more theoretical to pure joyous practice, you know? So I think there's a relationship there. So um, I'm interested in the, that, how, how, they, how one came out of the other. Um, sure. Um yeah, absolutely. I think I think I learned so much writing um, Als Dix, which is my first my first novel. And I would say that most of my interests are there. And that first novel is full of seeds um, that that then like appear here again, or that, that then grow in when I sing mountains dance again. I'm um, like, for example, in in my first novel, there is um, a 
like an interest on witchcraft trials that then I was um, like I was researching deeper for what for this novel or there is a little story written from the perspective of a cow and I realized that okay this is huge fun I want to keep doing this I want to keep looking at the world from these like non-human perspectives I want to transcend the, the human point of view um so Alt Dix, this first novel was um a, like a process of, of learning for me and also um when, when writing Als Dix, um, I was, as you said, thinking a lot about storytelling, like the, the, this novel revolves around questions on storytelling, on who, um, who does story belong to, or um, which stories survive, which stories don't survive, or who tells stories, who cannot tell stories, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, um, writing writing Al Zix was again something that that gave me lots of of joy it was something very playful it was something that i was doing um at night um while i was studying uh, an ma in in literature in in brighton in in the uk and even though i enjoyed my masters a lot it was a very theoretical masters um, so at night when I had finished all my readings and all my essays and everything, the only thing I wanted to do was like, like use all that, all those, all that, that I had learned in order to put it into practice and write this novel. And when I, when I finished Al the, the first novel, I realized that, that there were so many options, so many stories I wanted to tell, so many things I wanted to try, um, that I, yeah, as I said, I couldn't stop myself. And as soon as I finished the first one, I started like working on on this on this novel. And when I think about it, we've got uh, so, so it in is not not the misery model of the artist, it seems. Which I mean, <laughs> but the um, um, we've got, we've got. Let's see if we can knock off these last two questions quickly before the the hour. Um, one is, as you heard in the bio, Irena is um, also works as a visual artist, and um, other than um, a drawing in this book of a tectonic plate and a mountain forming, you wouldn't necessarily know it. But somebody asked, Serena, what is the relationship between your writing and your visual art practice? How do the two inform each other? Sure. I, I studied fine arts. Um, and I think that um, my, my writing process has um, inherited a lot. Or I, I learned to like to research and to write in fine arts. Like um, I use um, contemporary art methodologies in my in my writing. This means that um, that research to me is very important. This means that um, the process of writing is as key as the result. This means um, what I said at the very beginning that um, I when I start a novel, I I don't know what that's going to be. It's like a project to me more than a novel. It's an art project that will take the shape, the form of a novel, um, but that it could take another another shape. Um, I, I love the novel because a, a book allows me to do two of the things that I like the most. One, which is learn, research, ask questions. And then the second one, which is transform all that into a story, build a, a world and, and walk in and, and, and play around with the world that I have built. So I, I feel very, um, like, I, I wouldn't say comfortable, but I would say happy inside the shape, inside the form of a, of a novel. But I, I would say that, yeah, that the way in which my novels relate to, to the, my art practice is in the sense that, um, that they, like, are felt by my interests, by my um, thirst of, of learning and of like thinking on the one side and being very playful and having lots of fun um, on the other side. Thank you. Um, and then Mara, Mara, there's um, a last question for you and I, it probably leads to, I, we should express some gratitude to the Institute that I'm on the too because they're part of the story. Um, um, Mara, how did you first come across this book and what was it that made you want to translate it? And then Ethan, what was your initial reaction when Mara brought it to you? So see if we can straighten out that sequence. Um, well, I am a 
lucky in that um, I do a, a lot of work, well, uh, both for the Institut Ramon Yul, which is a, a part of the Catalan government that is devoted entirely to promoting Catalan culture and, and arts and literature and music and dance uh, abroad. Um, so it, one of the things that I do for them is to write a catalog of books that they choose. It's usually 10 books a year that they want to particularly promote. And, and we write a catalog with a little synopsis. And, um, and I've been doing that for more than a decade. When I first started, I was, I was um, translating copy that um, was usually like the back cover copy. And then after a while they said, but why don't you just write it in English yourself? And so um, that is always interesting to see what they've chosen. But um, as Ethan can attest, is, uh, certainly not every book <laughs> every year do I say this I want to translate, but um, I do get a chance to, to cherry pick a little bit from, from their very good taste. Um, and, and wide reach. Um, so that was how I first heard about the book and it was kind of early. Um, I, I Here this book has become really an amazing sensation and after um, Ethan acquired it, it, it won the European Union Literature Prize and it's, it's just been a real long seller. Um, and there's been a symphony of the mushrooms and the theatrical um, uh, version has actually won many awards as well. Um, and so, but I, I got an early, early-ish look at it, I guess. Um, and it, I was just really struck by the, by the voice, the voices, this, the, the, the joy in the narration is really, is really palpable. And I said, Ethan, I found the book we can do together. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, and it's funny because, you know, I've known Mara for a really, this is sometimes you have to be patient in publishing because Mara and I have known each other for a long time and we've never found a book to work on together. So then it's really fun when you find the right thing that you want to share. And this also, you know, I was lucky because I was able to be a guest of the Institute that I'm with um, um, in Barcelona, and that's where I first heard about Irena's um, of Deeks, um, and then I rashly waited around for a little while until this book was done, and then Mara said, this is really good, you should do it, so anyway, I think that's all we have time for today, so I just wanted to thank Irena and Mara um, for, for being here, and thank you for the book, and um, thank you for to Community and to Third Place Books. Yes, thank you all so much. Thank you very much. This was this was so fun, like Spencer said in the chat, no better way to spend a Tuesday afternoon. It's been a delight. Um, those of you at home, please do consider purchasing a copy of When We Sing, when I, when I Sing Mountains Dance from Community Bookstore or Third Place Books or your favorite local indie bookstore. Um, thanks for being here and have a great day. Thank you. Take care all.